Yeah, that's a lot of finagling, man. Good lord. Got a couple of, oh, three people. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Seth Joyner Show, show presented by Bet Parks. Man, we have a lot to get to tonight. You know, I thought about having a couple of um, guests come on tonight, maybe do a round table talk. But after that abomination that we watched last night, I knew I had to bring it to you guys, you know, and just have a straight up talk to them today. Um, I, I just, it's hard for me to fathom, you know, the depths that this team has fallen to. And as we watch them play, you know, potentially what a one and done or a two and done scenario in the playoffs can look like for a football team that we had so much expectations for. Um, they seem to be a hot mess right now in every way, shape, fashion, or form. And there's all of these different, you know, scenarios that are floating around how do you change defensive coordinators um, according to your head coach oh sometime last week and then the players come out and say oh we knew ever since the beginning of the week so listen and look at all the things that transpires um the doubt the uncertainty the lack of trust all of these things and how does it affect the player's focus? You know, when you got so many things going on, you got players that are saying things, you know, on social media, anonymous players talking about, you know, the offense is predictable and the offense is, um, you know, vanilla and there's no creativity to it. And then, you know, you've got the whole, you know, Sean Desai out, but up in the, up in the press box, and Matt Patricia in as the play caller. Um, and then the whole Jalen Hurts sick and traveling separately from the team. Um, how can a team really be focused and locked in with all of this turmoil going on around them? Um, we're going to get into it tonight. I know you guys got a ton of questions. Um, this is the Seth Joyner Show presented by Bet Parks once again. Um, Make sure that you um, hit that like button. Um, make sure you tell everybody, you know, what's going on here. And most importantly, I appreciate, you know, you guys continued support. Um, if you're not following, you're not subscribing, please go over to the Seth Jordan Show on the YouTube channel and become a subscriber today. Um, where do we start? Um, I, I think that we have to take a look at and start on the defensive side of the football today just because of all the turmoil that took place. And listen, there's enough blame to go around on the offensive side of the ball. I'm going to get to that. Um, I'm going to talk about the defense's inability, you know, to, to, to be creative, to scheme and coach players open in certain situations. But I'm trying to wrap my brain around this whole – Sean Desai out, Matt Patricia in scenario. Because at this point in time, in week 14 of the season, you're not bringing Matt Patricia in to do something that Sean Desai isn't doing. Unless you ask yourself, okay, is he running? And, and Okay, I'm going to go there, okay? This smells to me like an organizational move. Not a Nick Sirianni move, but a Howie Roseman move and a Jeffrey Lurie move, and this is why I say so. Because, first of all, Nick Sirianni did not come out, okay, and say that, hey, this is a move that I'm making. This kind of just slipped out. Like, no other media person in Philadelphia knew about this. Broken by Jay Glazer, Ian Rappaport, all these other reporters who don't even reside in the city of Philadelphia, okay? So that's how you know. It didn't come from the coaches. That came from upstairs because when the Eagles want somebody to know something, guess what they do? They're the ones that leak it, 
okay? And then you roll Nick Sirianni out, you know, and have him have to stand in front of the media and answer all of these questions for a decision that you made. I mean, I listen, I'm sick and tired of it. Harry Roseman needs to come down and make these announcements if they're going to be the great and wonderful eyes behind the curtain that's pulling all the levers and throwing all the switches. If you're going to be making all the damn moves, then come out and say, you be the one to come out. Why are you throwing your court, your 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 head coach under the bus again? Because this is the same nonsense that they did with Doug Peterson way back in the day. And I'm telling you, it smells and it reeks and it looks just like that all over again. When you look at this situation of where the Eagles are and how they look and how they're performing, it's hard for you not to believe, okay, all the rumors that you heard about the meddling from upstairs and all the noise that you heard about what happened with Doug Peterson and that, oh, you know, Jeffrey Lurie said, well, Doug Peterson didn't deserve to be, he didn't deserve to be fired. Newsflash, Doug Peterson wasn't fired. Doug Peterson quit. Doug Peterson walked away because he got sick and tired of the, the non-football people trying to tell him what to do and how to run the team as a Super Bowl winning head coach, okay? Now, we're starting to see the rumblings of this all over again, you know, with this move. Nick Sirianni didn't make this move, but Howard Roseman pushed him out there in front of everybody last night to answer for it. And I think that that's wrong. Because at the end of the day, what, what changes are you making? Matt Patricia was in the same defensive room as Sean Desai since training camp, since they signed him on here. So Matt Patricia understands the offense the same way that Sean Desai understands the offense. So, and you're not taking Sean Desai's defense, or defense, I should say, excuse me. You're not taking Sean Desai's defense and throwing it in the trash and putting in a defense that Matt Patricia is going to run. You can't implement a new defense in week 14 of the NFL season. So what is he doing? He's basically running Sean Desai's defense, and he's making decisions, you know, and I would say decisions that may be a little more aggressive because if anybody understands and knows about Matt Patricia, one of his fatal flaws as a DC and a head coach is that he loves to play cover one man coverage. What do you think James Bradbury was in on that 29 yard touchdown path pass to Jackson Smith and Jigba? Cover one. Okay. Cover one. And you guys know me. I'm all about, I, I am all about the aggressive play, the man coverage, and the blitz situationally, okay? But at least if you're going to go cover one, blitz the damn quarterback. Blitz Drew Locke. You let Drew Locke, a perennial backup, go 10 plays. 92 yards with a minute and 54 seconds left, and you allowed him to choke you out on the mat and prolong your agony. I don't understand this thought, and I don't understand these moves. These moves seem to me like analytical moves or moves that are being implemented by people who are non-football, minded people, because there is no way in hell if I'm the defensive coordinator on that team, do you know Drew Locke completed three third and 10 plus situations the other night? And not one time, not one time did Matt Patricia come after him with a pressure blitz, something creative to put pressure on him, the speed of his clock, and make him get rid of the football. They let him just waltz down the field and look like John Elway or Joe Montana doing it. It's absurd, absolutely absurd. Bright spot, if, I, if you can find one, because I'm going to tell you this. This is my hashtag for the week. This football team has been trying to tell you all season long who they are. You know what the problem is? We haven't been, we haven't been believing them. They've been telling us all year, all year, okay? They've been, they're a flawed team, and they've been flawed all season long and because they started off five and oh no no we don't want to talk about it 
You know, we don't want the analysis. We don't want you guys to break down and talk about, you know, what the what the problems are because they're five and zero. Oh. What could you possibly bitch and complain about a, for on a team that's five and zero? Oh. oh, then they have their first snag. They lose to the New York Jets. Okay, that was the first indication that something was amiss. Then they came back and they ran off five more in a row. They get to ten and one. And oh, we're gonna vilify anybody that talks about you know a ten and one team. They got the best record in the National Football League. They're going to the Super Bowl. And all you kept hearing was, "Oh, this team is so resilient. This team just got it's got fight." Good football teams don't talk about resiliency and things like that because you know what they do? They go out and they kick the other team's ass. They don't have to always come back from behind. They don't have to have players drop balls in the end zone to win games. They don't have to have fortune on their side. They go out and they make their fortune. So they've been telling us all season long who they are. And yet we refuse to believe who they were because of the 10-1 and start. Well, newsflash. They done got their asses handed to them three weeks in a row. Their confidence is shook. The head coach is shook. You can see him standing in front of the podium last night, just worn out, okay? The players are rumbling. There's all of this stuff that's going on around this team. Instead of them closing quarters, they seem to be creating these divisions along the way. Your star quarterback who never has anything negative to say, that is Mr. Positivity. Oh, some guys just ain't committed. Now, I give them more credit, you know, than I would give myself at some, some points and in some situations because when I was his age, I was not that mature. Listen, any of y'all that are old enough that's been around and remember when I was actually in the league, yeah, I called Rich Kotite a puppet. A puppet. Yeah, I called out teammates. Listen, was it the best thing to do? Was it the professional thing to do? I'm mature enough to say now, hell no. Because I know what it is to be a good teammate. And now that I'm a mature individual, I know what it is to be, you know, a bad teammate. That's not the way to go about it. But Jalen Hurts came that close last night in his commentary, you know, to wanting to call out those people that aren't doing what needs to be done. It's not paying the price. It's not doing the extra work. Because we know him. He's the first one in, the last one to leave. I'm not, I'm not absolving him in any way, shape, fashion, or form. He played probably one of the worst games that I've seen him play as an Eagle last night on Monday Night Football. Okay, Those two interceptions were unconscionable. But I'll get to the offensive side of the ball in a second. Okay? This is the problem with the emotional intelligence that we see in the game today. That coaches can't hold players accountable publicly, okay, for fear of losing the team. Players can say whatever the hell that they want to say. How do you have Darius Slay at the end of the week last week come out and say, oh, you know, I played great, but the rest of the team played like shit, quote unquote, okay? Y'all know I don't use French like that, quote unquote. That's what he said. Talk about not, you got the C on your chest, bro. Okay? You're a captain. Understand the situation. Now is not the time for you to be defending yourself and your play. Now is the time for you to step up for everybody else. But this is the era that we live in, that the players can say whatever the hell they want to say. They can do whatever they want to do. But the minute that the coach holds them accountable, the minute that the coach come out and says something, you know, and I blame Chip Kelly for sitting this, setting this in motion, you know, as, as far as this organization is concerned. Because I agree that there has to be a level of emotional intelligence. But Chip Kelly was so damn bad that Jeffrey Lewis took it way on the other side. Way on the other side. Now it's all about the players and their feelings. Oh, you, you, you can't show me a player who wants to be great that's afraid of hard coaching and accountability. And I'll show you a player 
who's lying to himself about his desire to be great, okay? The truth is the truth. If you're playing like crap, you need to be held accountable for it. Now, I don't know whether Nick Sirianni holds these guys accountable in practice. From what I hear, he coaches them hard, you know? And maybe I'm old school. But I was always, I always had the strength of mind. I didn't give a damn if Buddy Ryan called me out because you know what I was going to do the following week? I was going to prove his ass wrong, okay? I may have had a bad game. I may have had some bad plays, but guess what I was going to do? I was going to come back the next week and prove you wrong because I was smart enough to be able to take the information that I needed out of what he was trying to say and let the other stuff go out the other ear. But these guys are so damn soft and so damn sensitive that the minute that you say something to them, the minute that the media writes something critical about them, the minute that someone is trying to hold them accountable, they get in their feelings. And then the organization is afraid that, afraid that you're going to lose the team. You're paying these guys millions of dollars. Some of these guys are putting half a million to three quarters of a million, to a quarter of a million, to a million, to two million dollars a week in their pocket. And you got to treat them like babies? You got to pamper their behinds? What, 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 what did we come to? What did we come to, not only in the world of sports, but what did we come to in this world where people can't just keep it real anymore? Where people can't just call it what it is anymore? Where people can't realize that without accepting criticism, improvement is virtually impossible. And that not all criticism is criticism that needs to be taken to heart. I don't know. It, we, we just, we're living in a different age, in a different era, and I'm not sure that I quite really understand it. Um, let's jump over, over to, you know, the offensive side of the ball. You guys have known that I've been a big fan of Jalen Hurts ever since he was in college. And I, and I, I believe in his, in his ability, and I believe in, you know, him as a player. And let me set the record straight, because I'm tired of looking on social media. I'm try, I'm tired of hearing people making the comparison. Oh, here we go. It's Carson Wentz. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. Carson Wentz hoped that he was half of the player and the man and the strength that Jalen Hurts is, okay? Jalen Hurts has the mental strength that Carson Wentz doesn't have. He might not have the ability to throw the ball in comparison the way that Carson threw it early in his year before he became a basket case, okay? But there's no comparing the two of these quarterbacks. The role that you're seeing is markedly different. Now, he may have regressed a little bit, but I, I, you know, there's some coaching that has to go along with this as well, okay? When you look at Carson was always trying to make the hero play, and this is the difference between Carson and Jalen, okay? Carson was always trying to overcome the ghost of Nick Foles because Super Bowl 52 was supposed to be his baby, okay? He was supposed to be the beloved quarterback for the next 15 years in the city of Philadelphia, okay? When Nick Foles stepped in, there was a, a rift, a divide, if you will. There were not only players on the team that were Nick Foles guys and not Carson guys, but there were fans in the city of Philadelphia that were split the same exact way. So everything that Carson did was to come back and prove that he could win a Super Bowl because he wanted the love and the adoration that Philadelphia was giving to Nick Foles, which he felt rightly belonged to him. And it destroyed his career because everything that he, that, that he was doing was trying to get to a place where he could supersede what, what Nick Foles had done and it was a losing battle for him. All he had to do was just play his game and let the chips fall where they may. He still had the Super Bowl ring. He was still responsible for the lion's share of the wins that year. 
but he couldn't get out of his own way and his pride destroyed. Jalen Hurts is nothing like that. The only person that Jalen Hurts is, is competing against right now is Jalen Hurts. Okay? Let's get that straight. Now, does he have some challenges? Yeah, he's got some challenges. Because there's a side of him that wants to do it all. And as a franchise quarterback now, he's got to realize that no matter what the circumstances are, he's got players on his team on that offense that he needs to rely upon. Now, this is where I think the offense, the, the staff, you know, is problematic. We know that when Doug Peterson was fired, that Jeffrey Lurie came out and said, a high-powered offense with a franchise quarterback is how you win in this league. You don't run the ball, you don't win the game running, you win the game throwing the ball. This is how you do it. This is what the analytics say, okay? And Carson is being, I mean, um, Jalen is being coached in that way. You don't believe me. Just look at the things that he does, okay? There's a pattern, and you can go back throughout the season to actually see the pattern, okay? Their offense is designed for explosive plays. Conversely, on the defensive side, they want to keep away from allowing explosive plays, okay? When you look at Jalen Hurts in the pocket when he's passing the ball, he is always looking 10, 15, 20-plus yards down the field. And there's always a guy that's standing right in front of him that's wide open that he won't take the check down and he won't take the for sure, the high percentage pass. Now, all of these quarterbacks who have done that, they had to learn how to do that. Tom Brady had to learn how to do that. We, we talk about him as being the preeminent guy who learned how to dink and dunk and take what the defense is giving you and just cut you systematically, game after game, play after play, series after series. But remember, when Tom Brady first got to the New England Patriots, they were winning Super Bowls because of the defense and the run game and two and three tight end sets. Tom Brady didn't become that guy that elevated his game until Peyton Manning and the Indianapolis Colts got to a place where they were scoring so many points and scoring damn near on every possession where the Patriots had to evolve their offense in order to keep up. And in most situations, it would turn out to be whoever had the ball last is going to win the game. That's the way that – and that was the evolution. But Tom Brady realized that, you know what, I'm going to take the check down. I'm going to hit my back in the backfield. I'm going to hit my, 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 my crossing routes because, really, efficient football is about moving the sticks and being efficient each and every offensive possession. But this new age analytical football says explosive play. Explosive plays are less just like pass rush and blitzing on the defensive side. Buddy Ryan used to always say to us, if you guys want to rush the passer and you want me to heat the quarter up with blitzes, you have to earn the right to do that. The way you earn the right to do that is you stop the run, you shut them down running the football, you let them know that they can't run it as well as you know that they can't run it. Now you made them one-dimensional. Now we can turn you loose. Pin your ears back, D-line, and go get them. Every once in a while, we're going to send the pressure with the linebackers to go and get it. But you, first, you got to earn the right to do that. The passing game is similar in a lot of ways because you got to run the ball efficiently and control the line of scrimmage. And then you got to be willing to take the short to intermediate passes and routes in order to move the sticks and get to a point where you secure a lead. And now you force the defense into things and to fronts into coverages, into blitzes and things like that that they don't necessarily want to be in because they're behind. And now when you pre-read, pre-snap read the blitz, now when you get the look that you want and you got A.J. Brown or Devontae Smith or you got Dallas Goddard lined up one-on-one -on -one and it's, a, it's a, a, a mismatch, now you take your shots down the field. But teams aren't going to just let you throw the ball down the field because that's what you want to do. Everybody knows what the Eagles want to do. I don't know if you guys saw, you know, the 
the Peyton Manning, Eli Manning uh, with Christian McCaffrey, where Christian McCaffrey pretty much called, you know, the play and said what Jalen Hurts was going to do. That's how predictable they've come. That even the offensive players know exactly what the heck they're doing and what they're going to do. And I don't know whether it's a philosophical thing as far as the coaching staff is concerned. I know there's a philosophical thing from an organization level, but I'm not so sure. The question to me is Jalen Hurts making the decision to push the ball down the field or is the offensive staff and Nick Sirianni telling him to push the ball downfield? Because there are plenty of times when he's got guys on. But you go back to the first drive right here. 15 plays, 75 yards, 10 runs, 5 passes, touchdown. First series, first offensive series for the Eagles. The third possession, 16 plays, 63 yards, 11 runs, 5, five passes, and a Jason Kelsey doesn't lift the ball. They got a tush push for a first down. They probably score a touchdown there. Big play in the game. They got a kick. What was it? A 27-yard field goal by Elliott. My question is, for an offense that has been so disjointed and so inept and so inefficient, how can you have a 15-play drive, your first 15, and then – the second series, you go three plays and out, zero yards, one run, two passes. And then you come back with a 16-play drive, and then from there on, just complete ineptitude. How? How? I'm going to put some of it on Jalen, but I'm not going to put all of it on him, you know, because the coaches have the ability to be in his ear up until 15 seconds before the play starts. That's when he cut off all the communication. The coaching staff has the ability – to have him all week long and tell him what they want him to do and how they want him to do it. And I find it hard to believe that a team guy, a leader, a guy like Jalen Hurts is just going out there free willing it and doing what he wants to do. This is how he's being coached to play. And instead of taking what the defense is giving you, you're always trying to push the damn ball down the field. You're always trying to play the hero ball just having people say oh he looks like Carson Wentz you ever stop and think that this is how he's being coached to play because I'll go back to one of my old sayings one of my old coaches said what you see on the field is either being coached or is being allowed one or the other because the coach has the ability to direct the player on how to play and what you want him to do that's first and foremost if the player is out there doing something that's wrong and the coach doesn't hold him accountable and fix it, then the coach is allowing that to be the result that you see on the field. And that would be a sad thing. There is no, no reason in the world that this offense with all of these weapons and this offensive line for them to be as inept as they've been over the last three weeks. I don't get it. I don't get it. There's something amiss here. It's either a philosophical difference. The players have like lost confidence in what these coaches are putting out there. Jalen is trying to do too much. Jalen is trying to overthrow the ball to A.J. Brown. Listen, I know that he's your buddy and he's your, our number one wide receiver. But you got a whole bunch of other guys that can make plays. And when they've made it pretty damn obvious that they know that that's where you're going with the football and they're going to double him and not let you beat him, guess what? You need to use these other guys. And I ain't talking about no damn Quez Watkins either. Not talking about him. If that guy ain't running wide ass open all by himself and ain't nobody around him, don't you even think about throwing him the ball. Still trying to figure out why he's on the roster, but I digress before, you know, I go down that road too far. All right, I'm going to take a breather. I know I, I was supposed to take some of y'all's questions, but I'm still a little heated about, like I said earlier, that damn abomination that I saw yesterday. There was no way in the world the Philadelphia Eagles should have went to C Seattle and lost to Drew Luck and that football team. No way. All right. Whew. I'm going to take a quick break. Give me a little drink. Come back. 
We'll do a little whiteboard session. I want to show you guys some concepts that the Eagles can use to free people up instead of always looking like, you know, they're just trying to beat people on one-on-one -on -one routes, not stemming at the top of the routes, not setting your routes up. Team study film, just like everybody else, they see how to take things away. You got to do something different. So my question is, why aren't the Eagles running uh, more rub routes? I'll show you why they're not successful at it. And why are they not running some bunch concepts, you know, to get guys open and free guys up in certain situations? That's our whiteboard session when I come back in a sec. When you open the Bet Parks app, you're in the zone. Winning is always a rush, but the money is in the moment. It's the confidence and underdogs covering, the tension before a clutch turnover, and the pride of a parlay paying off. It's another chance to win big with all day action. Plus, win your first $10 bet and get $125 in sports bonus bets. You play for fun, you love to win. You bet. Bet Parks. If you understand that success is built on trusted relationships and dependable performance, Midpen Bank is the right bank for you. We're on a mission to prove that the right bankers can make a big difference. We work harder, we get things done, and we're in your corner. With financial centers strategically located throughout the greater Philadelphia region and new locations in central New Jersey, we're ready to bring you the best in commercial and personal banking. Call or visit us today to connect with a professional MidPen banker. Member FDIC. Go Eagles! Welcome to Bridgeview Partners, where IT and business innovation merge. We're not just another tech company. We're your strategic partner in navigating the ever-evolving digital landscape. Our team of experts tailors cutting-edge solutions to fit your unique needs, and ensuring your success is our top priority. Elevate your business with Bridgeview Partners. Discover the power of partnership and tech innovation today. Contact us now to experience the difference. Bridgeview Partners, where innovation meets excellence. Welcome back to the Seth Joyner Show, presented to you by bet parks um so let's jump into our um our whiteboard session today um and then we will get back in the rest of the time i'll be taking questions um no more commentary for me i said enough for the hour um question why are there some teams that are able to implement some things in the national football league and when you look at this eagles offense and you see how great of talent they have at the skill position that we're not able to do it. For instance, you know, teams when they get in short yardage situations, uh, when they're trying to scheme a guy open, um, you'll see, you know, this concept here, this this rub route, this rub route concept right here, where you get two wide receivers to right here. You normally you'll get one cornerback up and one guy off. Okay. And what you'll get is one guy is trying to pick the other. So what the Eagles do, you know, if they're trying to free this guy up, this guy here, they'll take this guy, they'll stutter him, and he'll run right into in this area where this guy is. And he's trying to pick him off and try to get this guy to follow this way and then rub him to the flat that way, okay? The reason why the Eagles aren't very successful at it, and you see some teams that don't really have success with it, in my opinion, is this right here. Let's do it this way, okay? This guy, when you're running this rub route, okay, instead of running here and setting up in this manner, I would like to see this guy, you know that you're going to get the rub, but the only way you're going to rub it and the only way you're going to do it legally, this guy needs to drive inside and hook up right here like he's anticipating the quarterback throwing him a pass right there, okay? Now, inadvertent contact is fine. They're never going to call that. But when your route concept is more in this mode where you're going at the guy and you initiate contact, they're going to call they're going to call the pick every day all day, okay? So why is it so hard? Why is it so difficult to just run in here and hook up? Okay? This guy is going to come here that guy's going to run into you, and now you get that to the flat, okay? That guy's off to the race. It's, it's simple, but you've got to get this guy right here to hook up, 
okay, in the path of the cornerback that he's trying to rub or the in the path of the guy that he's trying to pick, okay? That's one concept. That's one way to scheme guys up and get them free that I don't see in this Eagles offense at all. And one of the reasons why is they don't run it well. It's, I'm going to give you a bonus here. It's the same exact thing. <clears throat> it's the same exact thing with these tight ends and these wide receiver screens. I don't get it, and I don't understand, okay? So what they're doing is you've got a guy here, and you've got a guy on the line, and you've got a um, <clears throat> defensive back here, defensive back here, okay? So what they do, instead of this guy being the pit guy, where he's coming here and he's blocking and he's circling back, okay, they do it the exact opposite. This guy is out here trying to block, and he's bubbling out. And how many times do we see Dallas Goddard, you know, run into the defender out here because this guy is trying to fight outside because he knows he has contained. So while he's fighting, and you got Devontae Smith, the smallest and most – The smallest guy, the smallest wide receiver you have, you have him out here trying to block. Please tell me why this guy right here isn't Julio Jones or why that guy right there isn't A.J. Brown. For the life of me, please tell me why that guy right there has to be Devontae Smith. Six foot, 165 pounds. Makes absolutely no sense to me. And the stupidity continues week to week to week to week. And they wonder why these bubble screens don't work. Okay. I tell you another thing. The thing that I don't like is when AJ Brown is in this situation, when he has the block, he don't like the block. He does not like the block. And I would hold his ass accountable. I don't know how many times I see him out here missing a block like this. He's okay to run down here and catch 15 targets a game. But when it comes to him having the block, and having to put his body on the line is to, to help his teammate, that's problematic. And that's problematic for me. I hate that. I hate that. If this little guy, Devontae Smith, is willing to do it, why isn't the $25 million wide receiver willing to, to do what everybody else is willing to do? That's a problem for me. Okay? These bubble screens should be ran the exact opposite. This guy should come here. He's going to follow. He should loop behind. And now the pulling offensive lineman, sorry about that, the pulling outside lineman, once this guy reacts back, can get here and get the block. Now he can hit the scene. That's the way that play should look and how it should work. But the Eagles are running it ass backwards. Okay? Let's get to the bunch look. Whether you got the back right here, okay? Um, wide receiver here. Let's bring him a little tighter. Wide receiver here, and you've got the tight end and X off and you Y off, and you bring him across. Okay. You got three guys into the route right here. Okay. Set him down. Send him to the flat. Send him on the scene. Devontae, uh, um, DeAndre Swift is one of the fastest running backs in the National Football League, in my opinion. Why don't they use him in the passing game like this? Everything that everything that he runs is either here or here. Why? Why don't we use him up the field like other teams do with their running backs? That's one concept, okay? That's with the running back. Let's get the running back out of here and figure out how we can employ this with um, Dallas Goddard, put him on the line, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, okay? Dallas got it. Okay. We're going to push him up the field. We're going to send A.J. Brown to the flat. And we're going to run Devontae Smith on the post. Please tell me, what coverage do you have that can stop that? Especially if you got single high safety back here and he's pushing hard across. Now you put this safety in the quandary. Okay. He's got to make a decision. Do I cover him or do I cover this one? Okay. You got the corner biting here, zone coverage. Who is, who's covering who, okay? Let's take it back to it. Take it in another direction, okay? Let's take it tight, okay? Here's Dallas Goddard. 
Wide receiver. Wide receiver coming in motion. Two high safety. What what is the route that destroys two high safety? Okay, because this corner's out here, right? Tight end seam. Guy to the flat. Sit it down right there. Okay, and I told you guys we went over this a couple of weeks ago. How you defeat? How you how do you how do you defeat these bunch looks? Because most of the time, nine nine times out of ten, you're going to get one guy to the flat like this. You're going to get one guy that sits down in the middle, and you're going to get one guy that's crossing or one that's working up the field. So this safety now, he's got a problem, okay? If he sits on this, you got this right now. Jalen should be looking him, looking him off, come back right here. How many seam routes have you guys seen Dallas Goddard catch? One of the fastest, one of the most sure-handed tight ends in the league especially in the red zone. Everybody else has it in their playbook except for us. And we got one of the best tight ends in the National Football League. And yet this these simple concepts don't exist in their playbook. They just don't, you know? So I thought I'd share with you guys a couple of different ways and a, different, a couple of different concepts that teams are destroying our defense and making our defense look average. And you would think that we would look at, you know, how we're defensively not having success against certain defenses and take some of that stuff in the copycat league and say, okay, we're going to employ some of that, you know, in what we do. And I see some of the comments. Yeah, let's get Jalen out of the pocket. Let's get Jalen under center, you know. And some people, somebody said today, well, you know, what's the footwork like? Well, hey, listen. If he can learn how to be a franchise quarterback, and we all, a lot of y'all question that after his first year as a starter, what did he do? He went to California, got with Tom House, came back and proved to y'all that he could do what a lot of y'all said he couldn't do. If he can do that, you mean to tell me that he can't learn how to get under center and run a three-step drop, a five-step, seven-step drop, how to run some bootlegs, how to run some short rolls? Hell yeah, he can. Yeah, he can. But this offense isn't set up for that. This offense is set up for deep shots down the field. They line him up and shotgun 95% of the time. And when he gets the ball, he's standing four to five yards deep every single time. Every time. And all it takes is one offensive lineman to have a bad pass set to screw up any possibility of the of that of the offensive play, that pass play having any kind of possibility of, of working and it happened you know Sue Peta lost a few times Lane you know had got pushed into you know the the pocket a couple of times Jordan Mailata got ran around a couple of times not just last week but it's been happening the last couple of weeks and this this speeds up Jalen's clock so why are we not being able to implement the run game that we want to run from him up under center and then be able to implement misdirection plays, bootleg action. Not only bootleg action, but misdirection plays that buys him the added time in, 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 in the pocket for these some of these deeper routes to develop, but also gives him the comfort of knowing that if they don't develop properly, that I've always got a check down, I've always got a dump off, I've always got a way to get where I need to get to with the football and get it out of my hands. So I'm not always on the run trying to do magic, all right? Okay, that's it for our, our 101. Let's jump in some of these questions. We're just going to bang them out the rest of the way here, all right? First one up. Um, Jen Kim wants to know, should Jalen sit again? Hell no. Hell no. You, who are you going to put in? You going to put Marcus Mariota in? Y'all need to stop this nonsense, man. You need to stop it. You know, Jalen has to play better. But the coaches have to do a better job of telling him how to implement and how to do what they need and what they want him to do. You know, he's not playing that bad. Yeah, he's got to get the he's got to get the turnovers under control. But the reason why he's turning the ball over at such a high clip because their mindset is to push the ball down the field. Let's move off of that. Let's move off of you know. Listen, there are points and times in games, and there are matchups with different teams. 
where the game plan should be to push the ball down the field because it's a competitive advantage, okay? You might even argue that yesterday, yeah, you should have been trying to push it down the field. The Seattle Seahawks ranked 26 in pass defense, giving up 243 yards per game. But they also ranked 23rd against the run, giving up 123 um, yards per game. So the balance that they had early in the game was the right game plan. But as the game went on, they, they, they moved further and further away from what worked in the first half. And then Jalen just made some plays where he was just trying to go for it all instead of just understanding and realizing this is where good coaching comes in. We got to lead. We need to get first downs and eat up clock and force them to burn their timeouts. Anything other than that is wrong. It's dead wrong. It's a travesty. And this ain't the first time. Go back to the first Washington game. The Eagles are winning the game, okay? They're winning by one point. And Jalen checks and throws a 30-something yard touchdown pass to A.J. Brown down the right sideline at home, the first Washington game. And then they came back thinking that, oh, Sam Howell can't drive this team down the field. What did they do? They drove the ball 90-something yards down the field, converted the two-point conversion, tied the game, and now the Eagles are in an overtime bout. And then Nick Sirianni had the audacity to say, I will never be mad at my quarterback for scoring touchdowns. Are you freaking kidding me? Are you kidding me? First of all, you're already in, you're already in field goal range. The conversation that should have went and went on between Nick Sirianni and Brian Johnson in the headset with Jalen Hurts. Okay, we want to run the ball here. Don't check it. We're trying to burn clock. We want to make sure that we don't give them another possession. And all we really need to do is get one, one or two more first downs, and this game is over. But you give him the freedom. And the and and the and the range to say, okay, we're gonna check to a run and then throw it all over on the defense to stop, you know, an offense where you had the ability to just squash it all. Stop it, man. This ain't all on Jalen. Same exact thing with the Jets loss. No way in hell they should have lost that game. You got your quarterback throwing the ball on third and nine when you should be running the ball. They have no timeouts left. And all you got to do is run the freaking ball and run the clock out and then punt the football and force Zach Wilson, who has done squat all day long. They, the Jets had four field goals. Make him prove to you that he can run the ball down the field, that they can move the ball down the field, I should say, 50, 60 yards and score a touchdown to win this football game. But what do you do? You call a pass play. Jalen Hurst throws an interception. They run it back to the 15, and now you tell the defense, let them score so we got time on it, and then you lose the game, okay? This isn't an isolated thing. This Jalen Hurst taking a shot to Quez Watkins when it's unnecessary. Jalen Hurts with 20-something seconds left on the clock instead of checking the ball down to Kenneth Gainwell and uh, with two timeouts and allowing him to run the ball and get into field goal range because Jake Elliott's been money all year long. You throw the ball on a chunk play down the field in the double coverage and get the ball picked off. Game, set, match. That's not all on Jalen Hurts. That's on the communication that's being had between the offensive coordinator, the head coach, and the quarterback to make the right play and the right decision until this young quarterback in his fourth lead and fourth year in the NFL learns how to make the right decision on his own. I'm not absolving him in, in any way, but this theory that it's all him is dead wrong. And this thought that some of you guys keep coming up with that you need to sit him down for a week, that he's starting to look like, like, like Carson, okay? I'm going to cuss again. Bullshit. He's the franchise and the team's best option to win. Not Marcus Mariota, anybody else that y'all think that they have over there on that sideline. Next question. Gerardo wants to know what have big we have big corners. 
why aren't we bumping receivers to disrupt the timing and let the rush get home? Listen, I've been saying this all year long, you know, and, and I like this Killy Ringo guy, you know, I kind of hope that he gets to start the rest of the way. You need to start getting younger. You know, the reality is that, you know, one or both of these cornerbacks next year are not going to be here. Slay is going to be out for the next two to three weeks. He said that himself. Let this kid play. Let these young kids play and grow up. You know, um, it's how they're coached. The biggest travesty was not promoting Denard Wilson to be the defensive coordinator because look at what he's doing with the cornerbacks down in Baltimore. He was a difference maker on that back end. I can't even tell you the the, the DB the defensive backs coach name you know, for the Eagles this year. And I have it on good information that technically these defensive backs are broken and he doesn't know how to fix them. You can see that. How in the world do you get up and press coverage as a, as a, as a cornerback? You're up in press coverage. The, the receiver is up on the line of scrimmage. And instead of you getting a jam on him, Instead of you putting your hands on him at the line of scrimmage and forcing him to go where you want him to go, you open up horizontally to the line of scrimmage, allowing the wide receiver to run vertically past you. And then you wonder why they can't cover no damn body out of press. I watched Eli Ricks have pretty good coverage on DK Metcalf last night. But when DK Metcalf got to the top of his route, Eli Ricks overran the route, causing a, a, a pass interference. That's coaching, man. Because even though I played linebacker, I learned how to play man-to-man -man coverage from some of the best coaches they ever coached in the national in the history of the National Football League. Eli Ricks has got to realize that when, when DK Metcalf starts to chop his feet, stop looking at his back, stop looking at his head, stop looking at his shoulders. When he begins to chop his feet, that means that you got to chop your feet and break down because he's when he drops his hip, that means that he's going to break in or he's going to break out. So you can't just keep running full speed. That full speed run and that panic, I know what it is. It's the fear that he's going to run past you and you're not going to be able to keep up. It's a lack of confidence in the ability, in your God-given ability. And the right coach can, co can coach that out of him and make him technically sound. OK. But I think the Eagles are old at cornerback. Slay and Bradbury have seen their best days. The Eagles moving forward need to get younger. I've been saying it, I said it last year and I'll say it again right now. The biggest mistake that the Eagles organization made last year was a not signing C.J. Gardner Johnson back. OK. Not making a decision to choose one or the other, either Bradbury or Slay and not using the 1B pick that they drafted Nolan Smith with or the second round pick to draft a young quarterback to get younger at the quarterback position. And then obviously, you know, not signing TJ Edwards back. You know, you mean to tell me that Howard Roseman couldn't have found, I get it. They, they spent $6 million. They spend the least amount on linebackers of any other team in the National Football League. They spend $6 million at the whole position of linebacker. So it stands to reason that they weren't going to pay T.J. Edwards the $6 million a year that the, that, the, um, that the Chicago Bears is actually paying. But if you don't pay two starting cornerbacks on the outside an average of $12 million a piece, then maybe that leaves you the six million you need to be able to keep TJ Edwards. And that leaves you the six million, and you go find two more to be able to bring CJ Gardner Johnson back. That move was traumatic. That's the way I would have played it if I was the GM last year. Not both of these cornerbacks at plus 30 years old would have been back. One of them would have been gone, and we would have got younger at that position. Okay, next question. Todd wants to know that I think we need to switch up from Gainwell being our second back. We don't have a change of pace back. No, I listen, I thought that Kenneth Gainwell, and I've been critical of him all year long, I thought he ran the ball pretty darn effectively. Um, I think that I think that what you see is this competition between he and 
and um, and Swift. Because if you guys remember, Gainwell was supposed to be the dude. And the only thing that stopped him from being the dude was an injury. And then once they gave Swift an opportunity, he ushered Gainwell, you know, into the number two spot and back to the bench. But you can tell when Gainwell, listen, this is this is how these two running backs should be deployed. And I don't get it. I don't understand it. Swift is a guy that you run in zone and stretch plays. You run him off tackle. You run him outside. Gainwell has a good feel for running the ball up inside and hitting the holes. And sometimes you see him run them in complete opposite. Now, I get it. Sometimes, you know, if you if that's the way you're going to run them all the time, it becomes problematic because if I'm a player or I'm a coach and I'm studying you, then I, I understand, well, when Gainwell's in, they're going to run him inside. When Swift is in the game, they're going to try to get him on the edges. And we take account in that manner. So I understand that. But for the most part, that's the way their runs should be looking. Gainwell on the inside and out of the backfield, Swift on the edges and out of the backfield. Okay? Um, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not mad at, you know, I, I was – I was really pissed at Kenneth Gain Gainwell for the fumble a couple of weeks ago and, you know, his lack of, you know, just fortitude and playing and, and things of that nature. But, you know, I think he I, – I give him a thumbs up. I thought he played a pretty good game in the limited amount of touches that he had last night. All right, next question. Um, Jim Warner wants to know, did Shane just take the creativity with him to Indy? Was it in his playbook and play calling that was the difference last year? Hey, listen, it could be. I, I don't know. I don't know what's in that playbook. I don't know how expansive the playbook was. Was it Shane's playbook or was Shane actually running Nick's playbook? Has Nick narrowed the focus for Jalen? You know, is there more creativity in that playbook? Is there more stuff in that playbook? Or is this playbook really rudimentary to some degree? Nobody really knows. You know, I, and we can we can guess and we can hypothesize about it because we don't see the creativity, you know, this year. And then the question has to be, how much of this is Brian Johnson's playbook and how much of it is Nick Sirianni's playbook? Don't really know. We can only speculate. Only speculate. A couple more before we get up out of here. <clears throat> James Wright wants to know, do I think they should play the Kobe Dean, Co play the Kobe Dean more? And let's, James, where you been? The Kobe hurt, man. He walking around with a boot on his foot, you know, and he hadn't really been all that impressive when he had been healthy. I th thought I'd just throw that out of there. You know, the old saying, he's hell when he well, but he's always hurt. It's the truth. Next question. GT wants to know, can we turn this around before the playoffs? Um, listen, I'm hopeful, um, but I'm, I'm hopeful, but doubtful. Because at this point in time of the year, you're either, you know, peaking and ascending and getting better or you're descending and you're getting worse. And the same things that have plagued this football team that Jalen Hurts has talked about and Nick Sirianni has talked about, these things that we've talked about all year long continue to plague this football team week after week after week. You talk about insanity being, you know, banging your head against the wall doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Well, in a lot of ways, this is how the, the Eagles offense has been operating. They're doing the same thing week after week after week after week, expecting a di different result when the rest of the league has caught up to them and knows exactly what, what they want to do and how they want to operate offensively. Where's the creativity, Nick Sirianni? Where's the creativity, Brian Johnson? This is what you were hired to do. Give these players the tools and a toolbox that allows them to be the best that they can be. And I think this is some of the frustration that you're seeing from the players when you hear an anonymous offensive player saying, you know, we, we, we've become vanilla. We've become very, you know, predictable in what we do. This is the result of what you're seeing. seeing. Last question. Uh, Mr. Barnes wants to know, tell me the rotation cycle with the safeties and linebackers and with Sidney Brown and why Sidney Brown's not starting. Listen, I don't understand the rotation cycle. I think that right now, um, let's start with the linebackers. Um, it's clear that Zach Cunningham is the best linebacker on the team. 
um, Shaq Leonard is a shell of, him, of, of himself. That's pretty clear to me right now. And, and that's the reason why um, the Colts departed with him and said, hey, here, we're going to pay you $6 million not to play for us anymore um, because the decline is real. You can see it. There's no quickness. There's no burst. There's no thump to his game anymore. Um, he's indecisive. I know what that looks like because, you know, believe it or not, every single player knows, you know, when the end is near. They know when their time is 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 about to wrap up. I knew it. Every other player that I've talked to knew it way ahead of time. When I see Sidney Brown outside trying to make a tackle and Shaq Leonard jogging out there, not intent on laying the wood and not intent on ensuring that the tackle is made you know that's a big telltale sign for me you know it, he just doesn't have it it's not there so the rotation is what it is because it shows so short-handed at the linebacker position you know you're going to start to see them play more nickel um and more big nickel scenarios where they go three safeties they played more three safeties last night than anything else because they have to have that extra guy in the box now if you can't stop the run in the five man or the four man front then you're safe to you're 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 forced to load the box and go to some seven man looks so you see seen sydney sydney brown down in the box quite a bit as far as the rotation is concerned you know listen they are what they are they traded a third round draft pick for kevin byer you know he's another guy in my opinion that's you know seen his seen his better days you know so the so the two starters are going to be reed blankenship and kevin byer and sydney brown is going to get a lot of playing time in that third spot when they go three um three safeties because they can drop him down around the box he's decent in coverage but he's much better you know, around the box being a tackler. You got to be a better tackler. He missed some about four tackles last night. Got to, you know, grab these big guys down around the legs and stop trying to tackle them by the shoulder pads and hold on for dear life and wait for your guys to get there. But I love the way he plays. He's the only player that I see on this defense that's flying around and just laying the lumber. The only guy that, you know, that laid some wood last night was, Nolan Smith, and he knocked his damn shoulder out of the socket and probably is done for the season again. Um, we put that question back up because there was one more piece in there um, that I did not, um, that I wanted to answer um, for him. Um, if not, don't worry about it. But I think there was one more, one more part to that question. The rotation of the safeties and the linebackers. Um, it's all good, man. It's all good. We, we, <laughs> he's, he's scrolling through them all trying to find them. Um, anyhow, um, listen, the Eagles on to the next. You've got um, the New York Giants at home on Christmas Day. you got the Arizona Cardinals coming in the following week, and then you got to go up to New Jersey to finish the regular season against the Giants. All three of these games are games that they can and they should win. The Eagles need to know that these three teams, these three games, these teams aren't going to lay down and just give them the game. They have looked at how the Eagles have played the last three weeks. That you know, the, the Giants won a game not last week, but the week before. A game that they wasn't supposed to win. I forget who it was against, but there was they were not supposed to win that game. Then you talk about um, you know, the Cardinals. Although they've had their struggles, they beat the, the Cowboys early in the season and beat them pretty damn handily. So if you think that these two teams don't think that they can beat the Eagles the way the Eagles have been playing. The Eagles better get it together, and they better know that these three games are important because it's going to set the precedent for how they play in the playoffs. Now, I don't believe that they can beat Dallas in Dallas. I don't believe they could beat San Francisco any damn where. But the truth of the matter is they're in the tournament, and that's all you can ask for is a chance because anything can happen. Anything can happen, and you find yourself back in the big dance again. But I'm not overly hopeful this, that this team can – can fix all the problems that have plagued them all year long. Because like I said in the beginning, they've been trying to tell us and show us all season long who they are. But because of the record, we have just ignored it. Hey, that's the show for this week. Um, I want to thank all you guys for tuning in. Thanks for the likes. Thanks for the comments. Thanks for the continued growth of the show because of you. 
thanks for all the new subscribers um, to the Seth Jordan Show on YouTube. As always, you guys take care of each other and be good to each other. But make sure you love each other. Listen, happy, Merry Christmas. I hope that you guys who celebrate Hanukkah had a happy and prosperous Hanukkah. Um, Feliz Navidad, happy Kwanzaa. Wherever language it is that you celebrate it in, make sure you and your family have a happy holiday season. We'll see you right back here next week, same place, same time. Peace. Are you selling your investment real estate? Are you interested in deferring your tax with the 1031 exchange? At RevX, we're experts in 1031 exchange planning and the use of passive real estate options using DSTs. Not in the midst of an exchange and want to invest in real estate, but don't know where to start? Revolution X has institutional grade real estate options for any size investor right now. Set up a consultation at RevXWealth.com. RevX, defer the tax, maximize the gain. At Mandrakia Law, we win big personal injury cases, but we always tell our clients up front that those cases almost always hinge on how much insurance coverage people or companies have. At Mandrakia Law, we don't sell insurance, but we're experts at helping our clients make sure they have the right insurance to protect their businesses and families. Do you have the right insurance? Most people don't. For a consultation, visit mmattorneys.com or call 610-584-0700. Mandrakia Law, aggressive attorneys who get the job done. This is Seth Joyner, top analyst for the birds. I've also analyzed the best auto dealerships, and I drive a Davis Honda. Fall into savings at Davis Honda. Over 300 cars available. And right now, get rates as low as 0.9% at Davis Honda in Burlington. Plus, you'll get two years of free oil changes on every new and used Davis Honda vehicle. See why Davis Honda continues to win outstanding awards for sales and service, including the highest award from Honda, the President's Award. Get to Davis Honda in Burlington. Fall into savings at Davis Honda. J.P. Mascaro & Sons is a family-owned, locally operated, Operated solid waste service company in business for over 60 years. You've seen the red trucks with the blue elephant that symbolizes strength and reliability. Mascaro is different than other national brands. Like the birds, Philadelphia is home. They'll take care of all your waste removal needs. They have it all. An experienced workforce, state-of-the-art equipment, a cutting-edge recycling center, and their own disposal facilities. Call 888-MASCARO or visit jpmascaro.com.